Hey, what's up everyone? Uh, Lucas here. I'm back finally with video number 12, and I know it's been about a couple months, two and a half maybe, uh, since the last update, but uh, I've been hard at work getting these last few aspects of the Pixel Mapper uh, mapping engine working, and they've actually been quite difficult. Uh, one of the things that posed a big challenge was figuring out how to kind of wrap up every type of conceivable scenario in terms of number of channels, fixtures, types of channels into one uh, universal system. One universal system that lets you map and project content with a variety of mapping methods, right? In this case, projectors, um, and end up with the final result going out to each of the intended pixel controllers. Uh, so when you're dealing with just red, green, blue, this is a fairly straightforward process. And if you're dealing with just say movers like pan tilt strobe uh, it, it can be pretty simple too you just run content through uh, a mapping engine to those specific types of channels with a specific type of spacing uh, but as soon as you start getting to arbitrary lengths of of channels and devices where you have a fixture that's got nine channels and a fixture that's got five channels and another fixture that's got nine then three and then another device that's got just pixels uh, it starts to become a little bit more complicated. So that's what I've been working on the last uh, almost three months. And I'm happy to say it's come a long way. It's, it's actually pretty stable. It's working pretty well. Uh, in this update, I'm going to show you kind of how the process works from a front-end perspective and maybe touch a little bit on the back-end stuff. Um, and uh, also kind of just give you an idea of, of where that's heading uh, in terms of uh, yeah, UX standpoint. So anyways, let's just dive in and not waste any more time. So... I've temporarily hacked in some uh, video overlays. Uh, it seems actually a little bit more practical than doing this in post or through OBS, which is a good app, but um, I can actually see what I'm blocking and not blocking, so this is good, and uh, it all renders out in one go. So anyways, here I've got a, a little mock stage, just a few things going on, more of a tech uh, demonstration. Also apologize for my allergies. Um, it's been quite a wild ride the last few days. Uh, so, all right, we've got three things mainly going on in this scene. We've got uh, first device up here, which is an ArtNet device. Uh, that's actually powering those pixels behind me on the wall between those two shelves. Um, and then next here, name default nickname, uh, we've got a streaming ACM device. This is actually what's powering these uh, row of four movers you see up above my head here. Um, and last but not least, in this demo, uh, this kind of like the scene I've got here, we've got office desk, which uh, let's see. Um, so there's these like lights under my desk. They're essentially LED strips, but they're being driven by the pixel node. And the pixel node is the third pixel controller on showcase here. And this is actually a pixel controller I've been developing uh, for like the last over the last year now. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up. Yeah, you can see this. All right, so this is my GitHub, and if you go to it and click on Node MCU Arduino Pixel Driver. Uh, you're going to see this page. You might be familiar with it. You might not. This uh, this deserves a whole video all by itself. It's going to take probably about 30, 40, maybe 50 minutes to kind of go through in depth. But I'm waiting until this is actually done being worked on. Uh, and once it is, yeah, I'll talk about it a little more fully. But for uh, now, essentially, the Pixel Node is a pixel controller. It's a wireless device. It's got only one output. It's got a slew of command-based um, ways to interact with it, but primarily what we're going to be using in this video is the streaming protocol, which is uh, a very basic protocol, but it's a little bit different than ArtNet and those. So it's got its own protocol built in the GeoPix now so that you can use this device if you so wish. So uh, that's what's over here in the Office Desk uh, device. I'm going to talk about how I set these up. Um, I'm also going to talk about how uh, you can import them into your scene automatically, which is a pretty cool new feature I've been working on as well. So uh, down here we've got a lot of projectors. Uh, these are all basically just being used to control either the pan, the tilt, uh, or the colors on the movers and everything else. I've got my MIDI controller here hooked up to the pan and tilt, and as you can see in the viewport, uh, our movement is matching our lights fairly 
fairly closely. Um, I'll be talking more about this a little later too. Essentially what I want to do is uh, wipe this entire scene and kind of start from the ground up and build this uh, from scratch. So you can kind of see the workflows and uh, of course comment on them or if you have any suggestions, I'd love to hear them because this is very much uh, a different kind of approach to doing mining design. So. Again, I apologize for that. Um, so, here we are. Uh, Got to go and clear all this stuff out of the scene, so we can kind of just start from scratch. Uh, one other thing to note: uh, two other things actually. Here is the DMX uh, map for these four movers that you see over my head. Uh, these are nine-channel devices: a pan tilt, uh, a dimmer with a few other auxiliary controls built in, and then we have a red, green, blue, W pan tilt speed, and then a reset. So. I'll bring this back up here in a moment. Uh, also, I'd like to point out that uh, when using the Avitech Assistant here, uh, I've got two devices, and these actually match what you see here. Bud box number two strands. Um, well, actually, it doesn't entirely. This one's uh, named differently, but it was at one point named the same as Movers. So that's essentially what we're seeing here. Uh, movers is uh, streaming ACN Universe 13, and then we've got... Uh, universe 10, I just picked that randomly, and this is an ArtNet controller. We're only using one output to drive those pixels behind me, so. Uh, we've also got a fourth uh, pixel controller. Can you see that? Alright, so yeah, down here, uh, this like tri this triangular LED panel uh, is being driven, or at least it's hooked up to this uh, serial box, and if you're familiar with GeoPix 0.9, you'll probably recognize this page. Uh, it's actually running uh, off of this code as well. It hasn't really changed in a long time. It's very simple code. Uh, anyways, check that out if you're interested. It's on the web page under more. Um, but essentially that's going to be the fourth protocol. I hope I can get to test by the end of this video just to show you everything working together. Um, and so yeah, let's just go ahead and jump into it and get started. Okay, so first things first, clear the scene. Everything's going to go dark, including my face. Uh, let's see how the exposure does. All right, that's fine. So uh, the first thing I want to set up is the movers. Uh, these movers, as I mentioned, are um, nine channel movers. And I guess the first thing I want to get, set, uh, get going is, is the actual colors, maybe uh, the red channel, for example. So uh, before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and clear out some of the stuff I have set up over here so we can kind of start over from scratch in this area as well. Uh, I'm going to leave these uh, where they are. Well, you know what, let's go ahead and delete them. I'll just start over from scratch. So, Alright, we've got nothing in our scene. So the first thing we want to do is drop down a fixture because we know uh, that we have uh, a need for a fixture before we can actually light these up. So. First things first, drop a <coughs> fixture. We can name this movers. Uh, once we do that, let's go ahead and move this up a little bit. Uh, I'm going to jump over into hulls. Then I'm going to go into add mode by hitting A. And then uh, grid snapping is on, so I'm going to hold S. I'm just going to click on a few of these grid points. Uh, now that I've done that, I can select holes and, and then modify them if I want, but I'm going to hit Control A and just select all of them. I'll be in Tools, and then I'll go down here and I'll hit Generator from Selection. Uh, and what that's going to do, it's going to generate the uh, default number of picks that a generator provides uh, on uh, between our two holes. Uh, so if I bust open my outliner here, you can actually see what we got going here. We've got a generator parented to a fixture. Um, just for the sake of clarity, I'm going to rename this generator movers. We're going to delete this though in a little while because we don't actually need this for too much longer. Uh, anyways, once we generate our uh, correct number of movers, which as you can see above is four, um, and then we go ahead and jump over here to fixture. I'm going to make these uh, picks visually larger just so you can see them on the screen a little bit easier. Um, 
and by the way, the reason why you're seeing content on these is because when you have no projectors in the scene, it actually uses a default invisible projector, which always captures the bounds of your entire scene. So uh, it's just so that you always see something before you start adding projectors to your scene. Uh, but we're going to do that pretty soon here. So uh, we've got the fixture and we've got the generator. So one thing I've noticed here is that we've got a chance field in the generator. We also have it uh, in the, uh, the fixture itself. Of course, this is called Chan Order. This is just called Chan. So, one thing to note when you're using fixtures to control several uh, movers, in, for example, in this case, and each mover is nine channels. By the way, these are already set up to, you're not going to be able to read that probably, but uh, channel 11, 20, 29, and 38. Uh, so, I took the liberty of configuring those beforehand. Um, so I know that I want to start at channel 11, which is this guy here. Uh, so I'm going to type that in here, 11. Um, and also, because I, I already know what the channel map that this looks like, I can say, okay, um, well, I'm going to need all of these channels, and I'm going to need to make sure each one's present, because if I don't, there's going to be uh, a missing uh, some missing channels between important ones, and that will actually cause offsets that we don't want. So uh, the way to handle this uh, it's quite simple. We just go over here into the generator and we say, uh, all right, so I got pan tilt dim. We want to type those in first. P T dim. And we've got RGBW uh, speed and reset. So RGBW speed reset. Uh, of course, nothing's happened yet, and that's correct. Uh, and once we've done that, uh, basically, if we click on our fixture again, you're going to see that the chan order has actually been updated for us automatically. Uh, that's because the generator takes care of this. It basically says, all right, you're inserting these channels, so by default, we know we need these channels visible in our fixture. Um, and so once we've done this, we're actually done with the generator. Uh, like I've shown in previous videos, you can keep these if you want, or you can get rid of them. Uh, you're going to be tweaking uh, the shape of your geometry constantly, and you're going to be moving those hulls around. You may actually want to keep this, right? Because as I've shown before, um, you can actually move these hulls around, and your picks will follow um, those hulls. So if you have a big long snake, right, with lots of hulls, maybe wrapping around a column or doing some kind of more three-dimensional shape, you're probably going to want to keep this generator intact and be a little bit more careful about how how you proceed from here. But uh, Essentially, uh, essentially, yeah, I don't need this anymore, so we're going to get rid of it. Uh, just to keep our scene uh, light and simple and clean. So, all right. <clears throat> next things, uh, next we need to get some color up on our lights, and we're not going to see that until uh, we get a few other things sorted out. So, one other thing <clears throat> about these movers, and I think most movers are similar uh, in some regard, is that you need to actually have the dimmer value above zero before you actually get to see your lights light up. Um, and so to do this, we actually need to go ahead and stick a value in channel three and just leave it at 100% for now. We can we can hook it up to a slider later, but for now we just want to like max that out. So easiest way to do that, <clears throat> we're going to start, need, now we need a projector. This is the time we, if we're going to go beyond red, green, blue, uh, the default projector no longer suffices. So uh, just going to make one real quick. <clears throat> uh, scoot it back. A little bit, um, make it a little bit wider here. Um, all right, that's good. And I'm going to shrink it down on Z so it's not uh, blocking so much of our view. Uh, and actually, you know what? Let's go ahead and make this our color projector. We're going to need one anyways, so I'll name this RGB. Uh, Put it there. I'm going to duplicate this with Control D, and then I'm going to put this back uh, to the center. I'm going to rotate it uh, 90 degrees. And I'm going to put it below our LEDs or our picks, rather. And I'm going to name this uh, Projector Dim. All right. Uh, once I've done that. I'm going to jump over here to the I.O. tab, uh, and we've got a few things here to note. Uh, I still have 
some of my sliders here. I'm going to actually go and delete these. Uh, so we've kind of got the default spread here. These are actually not default, but uh, get rid of those later. They're not really too important right now. Uh, Alright, so I'm going to make a constant. Uh, I'm going to just move it down here. I'm going to name this constant dim. Uh, and then once I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and apply it to my projector. So constant dim. Uh, and once I apply that to the projector, I'm going to go back over here and actually pick a new color and set it to black. And then I'll set the red channel to 1. All right, so the only channel that's sending out data is red and alpha, but we're not using alpha, so it doesn't matter too much. Uh, so once I've done that, I come back over here. And so this is my projector that's on the floor facing up, right? And so I want to set this uh, to route the red channel of my texture here which is an RGB texture. I want to wrap my red channel to my dim channel uh, in, in Pixland. So I'll just type in dim. And I'll just clear these because we don't want those conflicting with anything else that we have later on down the line. Uh, okay, great. So we have we have our dim projector and our RGB projector, but we still don't see anything. And the reason why is because uh, we don't have a device connected to our actual Pixlight. So uh, the next step from here is to actually create that device. So there's two ways to do this, and this is one of the cool new features I've been working on. Uh, traditionally, you would actually go over here and create a device. And of course, you can still do this. You can just go ahead and select your protocol. In this case, it would be streaming ACN, and you can type in your settings and then activate it. Um, but I'm actually not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to do something, uh, do things a little bit differently. Uh, so up here in the top toolbar, we have uh, two buttons that you probably can't read. These are just temp UI. Uh, this one's called the Add Detect Manager, and if you open this up, uh, the, yeah, okay, it's fine. Uh, basically, this is kind of like the uh, the Add Detect Assistant. Uh, you hit search, uh, and in fact, it's linked to the same polling replies, so it's going to actually respond to the search you do here. Um, you can also just click search here. Uh, when you do that, it's going to return to you a list of devices it found. And uh, once it does that, uh, you can click on them and you can actually see what those settings are. And these are not all the settings it returns, it's just the important ones that we need for GeoPix. Um, and so the movers, that's what we want. And you can see down here, this table actually shows you what it's going to be bringing into GeoPix. So this is a kind of like a faux hierarchy just made out of ASCII. And you can see here we've got the device at the top. And then parented to that, we have a fixture, a second, a third, a fourth, and a fifth fixture. And the reason there's five is because Pixlite 4 has four outputs and then a fifth DMX 512 output if you're using streaming ACN. So uh, this takes all that into account and it fills the settings in and the parameters for you so that when you import it, you can more or less just hit the ground running. Uh, so I've clicked import. Uh, once that's in the scene, uh, I'm actually going to go ahead and grab that. I clicked it twice here on accident. Um, all right. So we have the movers. Uh, if I just translate this off to the side, you'll see that we actually have, yeah, the five fixtures I described. We have the device. Um, fortunately for us, we already set up the fixtures right here, and we have. Uh, we need to do some custom work to it, so we actually don't need any of these fixtures, but generally, if I were to do this through the importer for a more complex project, I would just use these, and I'd start adding picks from, from the menu. Uh, for this project, I would have just deleted those four outputs and used the DMX output. Um, as you can see, it filled in Universe 13 because... Uh, universe 13 is what's here, so it's actually pulling the information from the Pixlite so that it matches one-to-one. -one. Uh, also notice the device ID matches the device ID here. That's a very important feature. I'll get back into that maybe in another video, but essentially when that doesn't match, all kinds of weird stuff happens, and uh, it might look like a bug, but a lot of times it's not. So it's something that I'm currently developing. Uh, a better workflow around is absolutely necessary, but unfortunately, even for me, the person who built this system, I always forget that that's a, a an issue, and if I'm forgetting it's an issue, it's going to be an issue for everyone else. So, anyways, 
uh, the most important thing to realize there is that you need to make sure the IDs match. So in this case, we don't have any other conflicting devices. So I'll just use a device ID of one, and that'll be just fine. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and zero this out. Set 100. All right. Uh, so, we've set everything up. Uh, our universe needs to be set here manually, 13. Uh, and we should just go ahead and start seeing light when we turn this on. So let's turn it on. And uh, there we go. So our movers are producing lights. And they're in their default orientation. Uh, so, the next step might be, how do we actually position these lights and face them somewhere other than my face for this uh, example here. And the answer is to throw a few more projectors down and start tying different inputs to different channels. So, uh, let's duplicate this one on the bottom. And let's go ahead and spin it upside down. It's facing down. Uh, and let's name this um, uh, projector pan. And for this example, for now at least, let's just go ahead and hook up the MIDI controller. Um, to this device. So uh, let me make sure I make sure it's connected and working. All right, so I'll add the channel. And as you can see, I've got a slider. I'll add another slider because I know I'm going to need at least pan and tilt. So uh, here they are. Uh, let's actually go ahead and rename them. Text and then text tilt. All right. And now, in a in a real production environment, uh, you have a more complex setup than this. And this is what update number thirteen is going to be about. By the way, uh, is how you you tie the I/O tab, probably is going to be renamed, to the performance tab, and how how those two interact. That's going to be a totally different video. Uh, so please understand that what you're seeing here is, is kind of the bare bones underlying uh, mechanics just being used and tested with, with the basics. There's going to be other types of inputs, other types of effects, uh, modules that let you kind of mathematically uh, modulate or, or change your, your data that's flowing through. So you can do some very technical uh, workflow enhancements that make video work for lighting. Anyway, it's a totally different topic. Let's get into that another time because it's a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, so, for now, we're just going to hook up two, two sliders on our MIDI controller to two different attributes of our movers, um, and we're going to call it a day, more or less. Uh, so, here over here, we get projector pan. Let's go ahead and pick our texture pan. Uh, and the reason why this isn't doing anything is because we're not routing the red channel to the right place. And the reason why we're routing the red channel uh, is because MIDI is a single channel texture. As you can see here, it's just R, not RGB. And so because it's R only, we want to route its R channel to its current or correct destination. So uh, let's do pan. And as soon as we type P in, it's actually going to be sending that texture data to the P channel of everything that has a P channel. In this case, it's just our movers. And as you can see, they're rotating freely. Um, they're doing their full rotation, and that's great. Uh, so next to do is the tilt. Uh, so I'm going to go and duplicate this, and let's move our, our tilt texture, we can select it. We actually want to go ahead and make sure this says T. And so, right away, we have pan tilt control on our mini controller, and that's pretty rad. Now, of course, this is very coarse, there's no, uh, no fine-tuning here, but, you know, you can at least test and see that you're working, and this is actually going to be a pretty important part of the workflow when you're designing shows in general, because uh, normally you actually wouldn't you wouldn't take this approach that we've taken today. You would actually start with a digital version of your scene. Uh, you might throw some movers in, but you're not necessarily going to have all the correct channels. You're basically going to have red, green, blue, pan tilt, probably, maybe strobe, maybe a few others uh, that you know you can expect, and then you're going to build your show digitally off of those parameters and off of that knowledge. Uh, and so once you show up to a venue, uh, 
well, hopefully you already have the spec still white, so you probably will, but if you don't, uh, there's a way, there's a process that you could go through with GeoFix 1.0 to actually tune your physical lights to your digital lights. Um, that's obviously more of a concept than it is a reality. I, I've tested that some in my own office, but as you can see, this needs a lot of like field testing and beta testing before I can say that's honestly going to happen and work perfectly every single time out in the field. So now for now, it's how I'm designing the workflow, and I, I love to hear your feedback on that as a lighting designer, um, especially. I'd love to hear your feedback uh, because I'm not a lighting designer by trade. Uh, I come from the 3D world and the art world, and I kind of just dove headfirst into programming several years ago. So this is <laughs> this is the result of that. Um, but anyways, uh, this process to me seems pretty straightforward, and so let me go and show you what that process will look like. I'll hit pause on our kind of setup procedure here and. And I'll show you what that looks like. So I'm going to select my device. I'm going to turn it off. And our pixel lights are going to go off. And, and so now we just have a viewport. And for now, let's just go ahead and turn down this opacity and all this stuff so we can kind of see what we're doing. Okay, so one of the cool things about... Uh, Geopix 1.0 and this latest update is you have the ability to create uh, light fixtures that actually uh, act as preview objects for your movers or your picks, right? Uh, so to show you what I mean, I'm going to go into picks mode. I'm just going to hit Control A, right? Select all of my picks, uh, and then I'll go ahead and be make sure I'm in tools, uh, and then I'll click this button that says Light from Selection. Um, and once I've done that, it's created four lights, it's placed each one at the correct location, and it's filled in a lot of settings over here under Pixlink. Pixlink is a new section in the lights field that, if not filled out, it won't impact your performance, it won't even be used, and you can just position the lights like you would any of the lights in a three-dimensional scene. Uh, but if you want to link these lights to your picks, you're able to do that. Uh, and to properly show you kind of what's happening here, uh, we actually need something for these lights to hit because currently there's no cone volume preview. Uh, so let's go ahead and throw in a primitive. Uh, let's just scale it down. This will be our floor. Okay. Now let's go ahead and uh, duplicate that. Uh, let's rotate it. And let's go and put this a little bit closer to our lights. And I'm going to select my lights. And then let's take the dimmer from 5 to 10 just to make them a little bit more pronounced. Uh, attenuation, we could go up with that, but it's fine. Uh, that's going to be good enough for our previews purposes. Uh, so now that I've done that, if I move my pan uh, knob, you can see that we have a non-realistic but accurate, well, accurate in, in relation to these uh, these values down here, representation of our light's position. So we have pan and tilt. Tilt is, is a little bit less complicated to tune. Generally, you just have 180 degrees. But with uh, pan, most lights do not rotate 90 degrees like this. Uh, this is just the default settings for the viewport so that you can kind of hit the ground running with something that looks kind of interesting. Uh, <laughs> So, so how do we set this up to be a little bit more realistic, you might ask. Uh, down here below the actual minute max, right, so if you want to set this to be, uh, if your lights are a little bit more uniquely set, where each one's kind of got a certain range, you can actually set that range here, and your texture, when it goes from 0 to 1, is going to be going from min to max in this range. So right now it's negative 90 to 90. So both of these ranges are 180 degrees. Uh, and so that's that's one aspect of the setup. And the other aspect is the lag. So as you can see, I can really make these things move. No light in real life does that. So to mimic uh, reality a little bit closer, uh, we need to set some, uh, some lag and acceleration parameters. Uh, so just so I can remember correctly, I think 0.5 worked pretty well. 
and it, for the acceleration, a very high number, like 300. Uh, and as you can see, I actually only set one light, not all four. So let's go ahead and grab all of these again. Uh, 0.5, 200. Cool. So this is looking kind of uh, kind of natural. Uh, I think that's fine for the sake of this video. You want to tune this more to if you if you had your hands on a light in particular, for example, you could take that light. Um, and set it up with a digital representation and create a completely one-to-one, -one, as close as possible representation of that fixture. Uh, and then you can save that as a prefab, right? Because uh, something I've shown you in earlier videos is that you can export a single object that you have selected. So I could, I could grab this, this row of movers, right? And I could export it. Uh, and it would export this entire thing, settings and everything intact. And I can just bring that back into my scene later and start building my scene from modules I've built from other projects or other times. So that's kind of one of the strengths of this workflow. Uh, and that's something you want to take advantage of if you were building stuff uh, with the real real lights, you know, in person and then be able to like go back and use that later in time. So the idea is that you set up everything you need and then you build your scene from, from these modules, essentially. Um, all right. And so let's just go ahead and do this with the pan and the tilt. We start with the pan. Uh, so I think 0.25 worked pretty well. I need to move a little bit faster, so I'll do 300. Yeah, all right. So this is looking pretty good. Uh, again, there's no cone preview. I, I realize that's like a really important thing when you're previewing movers, and that's going to be... Um, Somewhere in the future before release, that's going to get tackled, but uh, it's not at the moment. But you can see it on a wall here, so that's uh, that's kind of helpful for this video. So, all right, we're done with that. Let's go ahead and turn the preview back on. I'm sorry, our actual output. And uh, let's take a look at this. So, if you put this with pan all the way at zero, our lights face forward, but our digital lights face to the right. And so this actually isn't quite correct. What we want is, uh, at least for this example, we want the lights to face forwards just like they do, I'm sorry, to the right, just like they do digitally. So uh, the way we do this is through adjusting the min and max values for uh, the picks. So if we grab our fixture, hop over to picks, um, we go and select all of our picks, and hop over here into Cham Map. And uh, this might be, I think you might you might have seen this in one of my small videos, but uh, this is the first time I'm showing this off in an actual update video here. Uh, and this is uh, the min and max area. This is going to be kind of changed and tweaked and made better over time. This is, this is very much like a beta UI kind of thing. But uh, essentially, we've got each of our channels. I'm going to select pan, and uh, left click will adjust the min, right click will adjust the max. And so we can just drag this to the place we want it to be. Uh, let's say that's fine. And as we rotate our our slider, our lights still move way past us in the other direction. So we need to pull in our max. And uh, that seems pretty good. So I can already see that our lights don't exactly match up with the movement we have in the scene. So if I wanted to tweak that further, uh, I could do that. I could just select these lights. So my, my digital lights get there before my real lights do. So that means I need a little bit more pan lag, maybe 0.75. Maybe actually more. All right, that's looking a little bit better. And so we probably want a little bit more lag on our tilt. 
Yeah, that's pretty close. That's looking pretty close. All right. So once we have that, uh, we're pretty much done with this setup technically. Uh, for the again, the purpose of this demonstration, not going to get too much into the content um, aspect of this, but uh, just to kind of show you, we could throw a white ramp on these movers. We could throw this kind of rainbow. Uh, it's not a rainbow. It's more like blue and red. Uh, even throw our pan slider on our brightness. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways that even with basic kind of nonsensical uh, assignments, we can do some pretty cool stuff, right? Um, so, let's go ahead and leave that alone for now. Uh, and let's go ahead and focus on some of the other devices we have in the room, right? So, we've been focusing a lot on the movers, and that's by far the most complicated part, but just to show you how fast GeoPix 1.0 can get you set up and running with other types of pixels, uh, let's just dive into that. So, now behind me we have those strands, just 12 volt strands running off of the Pixlite for uh, using ArcNet. And so, again, we could go through the manual process of setting this up, but we don't need to anymore because we have this thing called the Azutech uh, Device Manager. So we do a search, and we grab our Budbox 2 strands, which is the one I've got set up for those pixels. Um, let me go ahead and show you what's going on in the settings here. Strands, we got 73 pixels, just to kind of like crop it off at the point where it stops being suspended. And then we have uh, the start universe at 10. Again, that's just kind of arbitrary, uh, not too important. Uh, I just picked a number for the sake of seeing it here in GeoPix. So once we've done that and we've selected it, we're like, yeah, we want this. We just basically click import. Um, and there it is at the top. And so immediately, uh, you might have noticed that a bunch of my movers stopped working. Uh, they just kind of turned off when I imported this. You might be wondering why, gee, that looks like a bug. I don't actually know that that has a lot to do with the, uh, the overlap of different types of fixtures and devices and their settings. So uh, before I kind of explain to you why that's happening, <coughs> well, this is all part of the same process. So if you, if you look here, uh, we can probably... Yeah, so we have four outputs because we're doing ArcNet import. We don't actually need that SACN DMX output uh, that's only applicable if we're doing streaming ACN. So we have four outputs. Each of them is set to universe 10, but they, except for the last one, which is set to 11, and they each have a different channel assignment. Um, they all set to device ID 2. Now let's make sure that uh, these are set to device ID 1. Okay. So we're going to go and delete everything but output one because we don't need those for this. And as you can see, most of our lights kind of came back into play here. Um, and that's good. Uh, let's see here. Uh, maybe we need like a device ID. All right, we'll leave that alone for now. That last mover is still off, but I think I know why. Uh, so if you jump over here into hull, first let's move this whole thing a little bit closer to our arrangement. Uh, and let's go ahead and add something right there. Uh, and once we have that hull, we can pretty much generate a generator from that. We're actually going to make a grid by origin. Uh, and as soon as we do that, our fourth mover uh, popped back into place. That's actually strange. I wasn't expecting that, but <laughs> this is how development goes. You usually find most of your bugs before you do a video. So, anyways, uh, we want to basically. We can go ahead and turn this on. Let's go ahead and turn this on so we can start seeing some output on our LEDs back there. Uh, and, uh, you know, actually, let's. Let's put some different content on this because this is actually a little bit low res and difficult to see from here. So I'm going to duplicate my color projector. 
Uh, and actually, you know, I'm going to just shrink it up a little bit. And um, back over here in the generator, let's go ahead and make this a little bit wider. Uh, let's turn zigzag on, and I think for this array, I found that 16, uh, 14 worked pretty well. And then for the projector here, let's actually put some red ramps on it. Alright, so now as you can see, we've got this red shape that's moving from one side to the other. Uh, so more or less our, our kind of haphazard <laughs> LED strip panel back here is mapped, current, is mapped correctly. Uh, and that's pretty much it. We can now move on from here in terms of the mapping workflow and, and focus on a different area. So right off the bat, you can see uh, that we have two projectors. We have two color projectors, and this one's putting content on our picks, on our movers, and this one's putting content on our um, hanging device in the back there. So if I were to move this off to the side, uh, you can see that those lights stop lighting up halfway through because the projector's bounds actually cause, um, cause the content to be clipped off of um, that area. Uh, that's only, of course, if you have uh, extend mode set to error color. You can also set it to cycle. Uh, you can set it to mirror. So you can get some really cool symmetry. Again, I've talked about this in other videos. I'll go way more into this in another video in the future. Um, but this is obviously where the magic happens and Geopix is 3D projectors plus uh, clever projection methods. You know, right now we just have perspective and orthographic, but you can expect things like spherical, cylindrical, conical, other things like that in the future, and then also extend modes. These are pretty basic, uh, and you probably won't see too many more for a while, but uh, there's really not too many more that makes sense in, in the traditional uh, video and kind of photo sense. So yeah, these are, these are the main options. Uh, cycle is cool, but for now we're just using error color, which means you only see the pixels that are within the bounds of the projector. So, <clears throat> all right. So we've set up two different devices across two different protocols, They're both pixel lights. So let's go ahead and set up the uh, the third one, and that's the one that's under my desk. You probably can't see it, but there's a strip that runs um, across here, and it's running off of a pixel node, which is the Wi-Fi-based um, Node MCU uh, pixel controller that I've been developing on the side. So uh, the other button that's up here in the toolbar is actually similar to the first except that it's for this other wireless device. So the Pixel Node Device Manager, there's a bunch of stuff here I won't get into in this video, uh, but essentially uh, we scan for devices just like the Pixelite. Uh, and once we do that, my list is not going to change because I've already scanned. Uh, we can import whatever we want. In this case, I've named my device office desk and as you can see um, it just flashed green when I selected it which is good that means we selected the thing that's in front of us and all we have to do is click import uh, and once we've done that our uh, office desk device and fixture get imported into our scene so I'll put this one over here for now um, great so we have all of our settings good to go. So let's just fly through this and set this up really quick. Um, this is a strip, so let's go ahead and put a couple of hulls down. Um, I'm going to actually use these same points, but then I'm going to move this forwards a little bit. And then maybe move it up a little bit. Maybe down. Yeah, all right, fine. Uh, then we just make a generator from that. Set this to 30. Uh, and we're uh, we're good to go. All you have to do is turn this on. And now, I mean, I don't know if you can see that. You should be able to, but the color pattern that we see on the movers is actually being mirrored on that strip below. So they're being mapped together in the same area uh, with the same content, even though they're running on two, two totally different protocols and, and two totally different worlds in terms of... Uh, 
devices and how they're usually set up. So, uh, pretty cool stuff. So, the last thing I want to show you is just setting up the serial one. This is going to be too much different. There's not an importer currently for the serial device, but my hopes is to kind of revamp that protocol eventually and, and give it a little bit more intelligence so that you can actually uh, scan for devices and just import these into GeoPix without even thinking about it. But for now, we got to set this up uh, manually, so let's go ahead and do that. So I'll go to import because I know I have a custom fixture profile for this. Uh, so they're prefabs, geopix triangle. And we'll just open that. It's going to think. All right. Geopix try. Uh, all right, here it is. And uh, I'll just leave it right here. Let's go and zoom in on it. Uh, as you can see, it's a serpentine pattern panel. Uh, let's make it a little bigger. Um, great, great, great. Okay, so this is good. Um, now we can make that device. Things are getting a little bit crowded up in here. I'll go ahead and parent that to device serial. Fixture, that's fine. Uh, all right, so from our device, let's go ahead and pick serial. Uh, and now we need to figure out what COM port we're on. Uh, so if you haven't, if you're not familiar, you can always you can bring this up in Windows 10 by holding Windows key, hitting X, and then pushing M. Uh, you can also just search for the menus. Uh, so under ports. This, this item will only show if you have at least one COM port enabled for something, and so here it is, Teensy USB Serial COM4, great. Uh, so, I'll type that in here. Uh, I know personally that this pixel controller is set up to uh, do 400 pixels per output. Uh, so, uh, let me expand this a little bit more. Can't really see the rest of that word. This says output length and number of outputs. This is important for serial because it's expecting a, an array of x number of bytes, and those bytes are determined by uh, the variables here and in the serial device matching. So, uh, so let's go ahead and just, let me show you the math I've done to kind of figure this number out. If I have 400 pixels per output, um, and I know I have a three-channel color like an RGB, it's 400 times three. That's 1,200 bytes per output. So. Uh, that's why this is 1200. Uh, and once we've done that, we can just uh, turn this on. And as you can see in the top left, we have we have light and color on that on that panel. So, so this is good. This is um, this is kind of where things are at in GeoPix 1.0 at the moment. We have kind of recap. Uh, we have uh, these. These buttons at the top, let's go ahead and call these uh, helpers or wizards, right? That lets you import and kind of automatically generate stuff in your scene without doing it manually. Uh, this is the Advitech Device Manager. These do not let you configure them, they only let you import them. So you still need the Advitech Device Manager for configuring. It's honestly superior and they know what they're doing. So uh, I've just started the retrieval of information so that you can bring this into GeoPix painlessly and quickly. And then, of course, you have the pixel mode video on its own. Essentially, though, for the sake of this video, you can do the same thing. You can import that into your file. So, in addition to that, um, we've kind of gone through how movers uh, can be visualized now with actual light objects inside of GeoPix. So, there's been a few new um, functions built into the tools panel that let you generate this information quickly and easily. So. If you want to like select your picks and then click generate, you can do that. Uh, one thing to note about lights is that they are not um, free. They, they do cost a significant amount of performance. If you have like 20 or 30 of them, you can pretty much, I can pretty much guarantee that you're going to need a very fast computer to maintain 20 or 30 frames a second. Uh, so please understand that lights are more of a preview tool um, and not meant to be on during performance. And, you know, when you go to perform something, you want to delete as much stuff out of your scene as possible uh, because everything uh, adds up after, you know, kind of time. 
and, and it hits the clock cycle a little bit. Um, in the release version of GeoPix 1.0, there is going to be uh, obviously a way to optimize that. Just so, for example, the, the GeoPix 0.9, it's going to be the same as 1.0. When you click on perform or whatever button takes you to your performance engine, it's going to uh, nullify a lot of the calculations that are going on in the viewport, but uh, still, it's generally wise to, uh, once you have a show file locked down, to clean it up as much as possible and just make it as, as simple as you possibly can. So uh, there'll be lots of tools to help you do that, and there'll be videos and entire wikis on that kind of thing alone, so uh, not to worry that information's coming, but uh, anyways, that's the main points that we covered in this video. Um, and yeah, the fourth one is just showing you actually now that we have this all working, kind of what the the real-time patching and routing system kind of looks like, how it works, uh, how you can kind of mix movers and LEDs and different protocols all in the same environment. And uh, I think that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and until 13, uh, take it easy. Thanks.